Welcome to How Not to Think, the podcast that gets you thinking about thinking and looks at flaws in the thinking of the default mind, such as binary thinking, stereotypes, and myths. Today, I'm delighted to have with me, all the way from the Isle of Man, off the UK, Dr. Rodney King. Rodney has got uh, an extraordinary set of credentials. In fact, I think he's got more letters after his name than he does in it. He is, uh, he is actually an expert in both the physical and the mental side of success. He's a black belt uh, jiu-jitsu expert. He is a mindfulness and leadership expert. He's a self-reliance expert. He has a self-reliance what he calls pod class, which I like. Um, He's a certified member of uh, strategic risk management. He's an author, book, full contact living. He's also a leader in personal threat management. He got a PhD from the University of Leicester in the UK, uh, which is just down the road from the University of Nottingham, where I got my degree, but, but Rod was there about a century after me. Anyway, Rod, thanks for taking the time to joining us. It's great to have you on the show. Sure. Well, no, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. So like we always like to do first with all our guests, just, just a little bit of background of how you got to be involved in so many things, um, just your journey, short form. Well, yeah, I'm going to have to give you the Cliff Notes version of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm, I'm originally from South Africa. I was born in Johannesburg. Um, I grew up in government housing, similar to the projects in the United States. Mm-hmm. I endured what can only be described as not a very uh, pleasant childhood. Um, bullies, gangs. My mother was a raging alcoholic, an abusive alcoholic. Mm-hmm. Um, she kicked me out of the house when I was 17, so I never finished high school. Found myself sleeping on the streets of Johannesburg had nowhere to go, uh, enrolled into the military early because back in those days, military service in South Africa was compulsory. So I went to the military. I served in the VIP protection wing. I was a platoon sergeant. It was my first taste of leadership. I credit the South African Defense Force for teaching me the skills of leadership, which I didn't really understand until I got there. And once I left the military, there was nothing available for me. You know, nobody wanted to hire me. I couldn't find a job. So the only thing I could find was working the door. And I ended up being a doorman working as a bouncer for close on seven years while all along trying to become a full-time martial arts teacher, which was my passion and something that I'd loved since I was six years old. And I just didn't know how I was going to do it. And so it took me about seven years to finally get to the point where I was able to open a full-time school and then went on to create a couple of programs that are now taught all over the world. So the rest is history, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as tough as that background sounds, and I'm sure was, uh, it sounded like you reacted to it in a positive way in trying to make the best of yourself uh, against what sound like very difficult circumstances. Sure. Absolutely. Look, I'm not going to lie and say it was easy. Um, like anybody, there were days when I wanted to give up, you know, the days where you think to yourself, you know, just, is this as good as it gets? I mean, why am I in this situation? Like, why was I born into this? But I'm always rem- reminded by the words of Viktor Frankl, where he talks about, you know, the last of human freedoms is your ability to choose your own given attitude in any set of circumstances. And that's what I decided to do. And I think probably part of the thing that saved me For whatever reason, I mean, you don't know why you end up doing things that you do, but I was always into reading. I always loved books ever Mm -hmm. since I was a young child. And and actually, that was the thing that I would want for birthday presents or Christmas presents. So I actually read um, Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, probably at about 16. Wow. Now, I'm not wow. saying I understood everything, but that's why I know that quote. Right. <laughs> so, you know, and so that was kind of my mantra when I found myself sleeping on that uh, park bench and not knowing where I was going to go to. I decided to choose my own attitude and I've, I've kind of used that throughout my life. And I'm not saying, like I said, I'm not saying it was easy. There are lots of obstacles. And like anybody else, I have good days and bad days. But I do definitely think that choosing your own attitude is very, very important in success. And if you can get that right, 
that can lead you through some really difficult times. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I like to say that in some ways you're only as tough as your worst experience. Uh, and those negative experiences, well, no, we shouldn't say negative experiences because there's positive things in there too. Mm -hmm. But, but those tough experiences, I'm sure shaped you and, uh, you know, each time you overcame them or moved through them or survived them or whatever it was, you learned something important about life. Uh, that other people uh, of your own age just didn't know. Sure. And when I was just actually talking about this earlier today. You know, when I look back in some of the toughest moments of my life, it was actually in those moments where I had the best ideas. Mm -hmm. you know, the things that really kind of catapulted me forward were in those moments of total despair. And sometimes you have to reach rock bottom in order to move forward. I think a lot of people, that's what they're afraid of. You know, they, they're afraid of, of losing, of messing up and, and, and not achieving what they want to. And they, they don't ever give themselves permission to feel vulnerable. And maybe that's what I did in, instinctively. Um, but definitely as, a, as an adult and in the last several years, I've started to realize that vulnerability is a strength and it's not a weakness. And it's only when you're willing to accept the things that you can't actually control that you start to change the direction of your life you know because at the end of the day bad things are going to happen but the one thing you can control is your attitude and that's what Viktor Frankl was um, alluding to right I mean as you know you've probably read that book you know in that book he just talks about how people that were around him while he was in the concentration concentration camp in Auschwitz there were people from all different backgrounds. Some people were super intelligent, came from wealthy families. Some were poor and impoverished. You couldn't tell based on that who was actually going to survive, right? And so what interested him was that the people that actually pulled through, some rich, some poor, some educated, not educated, were ultimately the people that chose their attitude in those, in those situations. And everybody was in the same boat. Mm -hmm. You know, so some people survived and some people didn't. So what was it? And his conclusion was that was it, right? Is that they chose to make the best of the situation they found themselves in. And although they might not have been able to control the external environment, they could definitely control how they interacted with that external environment. And that's maybe just something that I was lucky to figure out instinctively, not necessarily knowing it per se, but in hindsight, looking back, right, I can say, okay, you know, that, that's kind of what I did. And so when, when I'm teaching now, that's what I always try to bring across, you know, th those kinds of lessons I think are very important. It's, it's important, I think, also for people to hear it because we're, especially as men, we're in a situation where we don't ever want to talk about our vulnerabilities. We don't ever want to talk about the things that scare us and our shadows. And I think that's unfortunate because I think it holds a lot of guys back. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. And also there's cultural shifts too. And certainly in the US, we have quite a number of people. And, and in some ways, lots of the society is organized around this concept of being a victim. Uh, and the victim mentality is, in my belief, and I'm sure yours, the worst mentality you can take because you're abdicating really any responsibility uh, a lot of the time for doing that. And that's the last thing that you can do. And that's not to say that people have horrendous experiences. Of course they do. They do. But what's the most effective mindset is exactly what you said. How am I going to respond to this? Am I going to sit here broken and feel I've got to be rescued by somebody? Or am I going to do that myself? Mm, yeah, I think that victim mentality is a, is a big thing. You know, drawing that further, what I tend to see a lot of times is that people are habituated. And so they fall into this habit of how they do things without questioning. And they're too afraid to look inside to have those very difficult questions with themselves. So what is it about me that makes me do this? And if I look back on growing up as a child, I can definitely see that many of the hangups that I had in adulthood and still do to some degree are very much defined and have been from how I was brought up environment. I always say this environment informs behavior. 
And so my environment had a very dramatic effect on me. And many of the things that I struggled with in, as a young adult was definitely related back to that. But now if I was just going to have an attitude of, well, it's just like me to do that. And it's out of my control and there's nothing I can do about it. That's that victim mindset. Then there is nothing you can do about it. But if you start looking inside and you start looking at your shadows and seeing the shadow is not as something to run away from, but actually the shadow leads to the light. I mean, if you're really going to find the truth in anything, you have to go into the darkness. I mean, this is a storyline as old as time. You see mm -hmm. them all wars, you know, you know, and, and, and everywhere. So it definitely is something that, that comes to light. And I think it's really important to do that, but it's not going to be comfortable. And, and I think this is something that I notice all the time is that, we're in a situation where we expect everything right now and we don't want to put any work into it and we don't want to feel uncomfortable. And we live in a very much in the Western world in a society that I call the Pollyanna effect where everybody has to be positive all the time. And should you not be like that, then you labeled as some kind of crazy person, you know, and people are always throwing these memes up on Facebook, you know, you know, always surround yourself with positive people and kick the negative people out. Well, what if those people are not actually being negative? What if they're actually giving you some constructive feedback that if you listen to could fundamentally change your life for the better? Yep, absolutely. And, and in some ways, uh, you know, positive psychology, I think gives the wrong flavor to that. I, I think a much better phrase is adaptive psychology. Um, you know, cause that's what it's about is about adaptation. It's, Positive implies, oh, you got to be have a smile on your face, all, and then that's just not practical or useful. Actually, um, you know, you got to be, you got to be authentic, but you got to be adaptive and resilient. No, that's a really good word. I like that word, adaptability. If I can just use an example from the martial arts world, when I'm coaching, one of the things when people ask me, they go, "Coach, you know, what do you, what do you want most from us? What do you want to most see us achieve?" And that's exactly what I'll say to them. I'll say, "Look, you know what? I really want to be able to see you do is be adaptable in any kind of situation that arises. The thing is, though, in order for you to be adaptable, you have to be innovative. You have to come up." with novel ideas and then apply them because that's really what innovation is so what is that idea of coming up with novel ideas is creativity so you have to develop creativity but the interesting thing and the paradox of creativity is is that you need to be willing to fail and unless you're willing to take risk and fail you will never be creative you will never innovate and you will never be adaptable so you actually have to put yourself in a position where you no longer care of the consequences and if you lose, it's not a loss. It's just an opportunity to reframe and look at a situation or a problem in a completely different light. And then you start asking yourself, how can I bring my creativity to bear? How can I come up with some novel ideas of how I can maybe move my body or just even just how I think about the situation, which then invokes that innovation where suddenly something pops into reality that just works and the reason you were able to do that ultimately leads to adaptability, but it comes all the way back to risk. You have to take risk, which means you might have to fail. And again, you know, we're looking at a society where we seem to, it's like we bow to the gods of perfection, right? And that everybody needs to be perfect and everybody has to be kind of set in a certain way. Mm -hmm. It needs to be done this way. And if you look at school, schooling is a good example. We make people learn things off by heart and somehow that equals knowledge, which we know it doesn't, right? But it's about having a perfect score. I know tons of people that are super intellectual and are great academics, but can't do anything else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, no, you know, no, so no. what does it matter that you have all this information? I mean, information to me is pointless unless you can apply it. And that to me is the definition of knowledge. Knowledge is the application of information. Yeah. So how do yeah. you get to that? By being willing to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a great story about that from my own experience in uh, high school. We had two history teachers. I had the one who was just regurgitate the facts. Right? When was the battle of this and what happened? Right? The other teacher was completely different. He tried to take his students back to the time and what it would be like to live there and be there, which was real history. And it was interesting. They would, you know, change, they would 
give each other's students the papers to mark. And the real historian, you know, would give you back your paper saying, you know, A plus, but you'll never be a historian. Because all you're doing is just repeating the facts. And that doesn't make you a historian, right? And it was a good example for me as a relatively young man to realize, yeah, you can have all the facts you want. But if you don't use them, if you don't put them in context, if they don't allow you to live them in some way, then it's kind of a waste of time. And unfortunately, a lot of education today is like that. I'm sure you were certainly in the Western world. Mm. So it's interesting you mentioned your history teacher. So when I was in grade 10, which is my final year of school before I got kicked out of the house, mm -hmm. I had a fantastic history teacher too. I was failing all the other subjects, all of them. I was flunking everything. But history that year, I got a distinction. And the reason why was that she took history and she made it alive. When she would get up on the table, she would act out scenes and she would just bring you into that experience. And she was willing to make a fool of herself. Mm -hmm. And so... <laughs> You know, again, that speaks to her um, ability to say, you know what, I don't care if this fails, but I want to bring the best out of this experience. And so she was totally creative and totally innovative. And it really worked for me and for pretty much everybody else in the class. Hmm. You know, it's kind of interesting in hindsight, you know, when I was at school, I mean, you would think that it just shows you how the schooling system, at least where I was growing up, didn't care one way or the other. But if you're looking at a kid's report and you're seeing that they're failing at everything, but this one subject, which is really a learning subject, right? Mm -hmm. You've got a memory subject there. This kid's coming in at 97% on everything. How is that possible? Well, they didn't ask that question. Right? Right. I didn't really have to worry about that because I was out of school the next year. So that was the end of it for me. Yeah, well, I um, one time I found myself in a meeting uh, with some really high-powered people at Yale in education. We were talking about a project, and I said to them, you know, when I get a student in, and that could be anyone from first grade to somebody in graduate school, but when I get them in, I typically ask them what their favorite subject is. And a lot of the time, they come back with the same answer and no the answer isn't recess what is it and these guys high-powered guys didn't get the answer and the answer often is and i think you probably just nailed it the subject taught by my favorite teacher mm -hmm. and you're a great example of that here's a teacher that connected with you and man you're you're flying high all those other teachers are just boring don't connect with you there's a disconnect why would you be interested in them? You know? mm, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, that, and that's huge for education at every level, at every level. I mean, not just high school or kindergarten. I mean, every level. You've got to be engaged, right? Sure, absolutely. Sure. I mean, yeah. And I mean, she, she instilled the, the love of history in me that mm. even to this day, it's something that I really enjoy and, I, and I, you know, I still read about and I still want to find out about. So that's fantastic. So it didn't just end there in the classroom. Right? It permeated into every aspect of my life. That's awesome. So you've, you obviously do a lot of things. You've got this martial arts, physical um, competence, if you want, background. And um, do you, are you still doing a lot of that or have you, you moved more into sort of the leadership uh, role? And I understand those aren't disconnected, but you know, in terms sure. of. Yeah, that's a really good question. So a little while ago, a few years ago, I kind of found out that I had DGEN in my neck. Um, and so things didn't look really good. The neurosurgeon said to me, you know what, maybe you should consider doing something else for a living. <laughs> but I, I couldn't at that time and I still really can't and I love it you know it's something that I really enjoy but what I've started doing is I've started moving more into how can I take what I know from the physical realm the martial arts and how can I apply that to subjects or topics or areas that most people wouldn't think it would be in and so rather than you know, although I still have that part where I do go down I'm very lucky and humble to teach special force military operators and teams and law enforcement groups around the world the part that i love the most the thing that gives me the most enjoyment is showing people how they can use what we can maybe call this primal skill which really it is because since the dawn of mankind it's one of the things that we had to do we had to survive we had to protect and how can you apply that so that you can take on the martial arts of everyday life more skillfully 
And so that excites me. And, and so I try to apply that into everything I do. Even if I'm working with leaders, I try to, what I would, you know, what is typically described as an embodied experience rather than us just having a cognitive sit down, have a conversation, which is great. There's nothing wrong with it. But what I find oftentimes is that you still have to go out, right? You still have to apply it. And so when you apply it, it's not just your head applying it. You have to bring all of yourself to that experience. So if I can teach you how to achieve success using your body, all of you, not just your, your head, because we're very much in a head centric society, right? Yeah. Most people just live up here and the body is just something that gets them from point A to point B. If I can teach you how to embody that experience through something like martial arts, I've found that it crosses over into everyday life in a more practical sense because it means more to you because you've, been, you've, been, you've, you've embodied it, right? You've, been, you've grounded within your, your experience. And the, the brain is not the only part of your experience. It's not the only part of your memory system. Your body has its own memory. And anybody that suffered through trauma knows this, is that the body will respond before they're even consciously aware of something, if something happens in the environment that brings them back to that trauma. So I think the, the body is neglected it's definitely something that isn't taken into account in, in many spheres, but especially in leadership, because most leadership environments tend to be heavily brain-centric, cognitive, you know, thinking rational, where ironically, and you know this, and you've said this to me before, is that you know, we actually aren't rational, right? Is that we are emotional, and, and we tend to tell ourselves stories. And as you've noted, people are really storytellers. And those stories are often stories that um, hold us back. They're in the past or the future and the things that get in our way. But to think that those only come from our memory bank in our head, I think is incorrect. Is actually, you know, the body plays a very important role and the mind and body are not separated. So I try to bring that in. It makes sense, right? If you're saying to somebody, look, mind and body are not separated. They're interconnected. They feed off each other. Well, how do, you, how do you bring that across to somebody? One way to do that is actually through the physical experience. Yep. And then you know, when you attach the, the cognitive aspect to it, then you really get in them to understand how that feedback loop actually works. Yeah, I, I, Rod, I think this is really brilliant and very important. I really do. Um, we do, so many people just live um, in their heads and that's it. The mind and body are not separate. <laughs> They're not the same, but they're not separate. Sure. They're overlapping. Uh, one of my favorite books, you know, 20 plus years ago, Candace Pert's Molecules yes. of Emotion. Emotions. Your body is your subconscious, right? Uh, there's, connect, there's connection there. And, and what's interesting from the neuroscience research is, yes, you do things, you change your brain, you change your brain structure. But you can't do that just by thinking about something. You've got to actually physically do something different. So the embodiment of something is really critical because you're training your body and your brain, right? Uh, and yeah, I know there's some research. I know if you just visualize doing exercises, maybe you, you know, you, you get a little muscular, but the fact is that movement is critical and your, the embodiment of what you're trying to do I think it's huge and there's a big part, big part that is missing from education at every level. Yeah, you're right. So one of the things too is that I teach is the other way around that, and there's some research on this and I, and I get that, you know, with any research, there's always, you know, the detractors, I get all of that. So we can point to the research, but let me say through my own experience and, and my life's experience, this is, this is something that I've noticed and something that I teach is that when you change your body posture, the way that you hold your body will change your physiology. And that in turn will change how you feel about yourself, which ultimately would change how you think about yourself. So when we say that the mind and body are connected, there's, there's two ways to do this, right? If I find myself in a difficult situation, I can change the way that I'm thinking about it. So I can employ something like, say, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy. I can challenge my thought pattern. But I can also change the way that I'm thinking by the way that I change and hold my body. So body posture is, is very important. One of the ways that I describe that is how you show up matters more than you think. Mm -hmm. And that, that's very, very important. And so when I'm thinking about across the board, right, let's think uh, defensive tactics 
in the world of martial arts and you want to apply this in a self-preservation mm -hmm. environment. Well, if I look dejected, I don't look confident, I'm going to, there's more likelihood that a perpetrator, a criminal will go for me because I look that way. When I'm, you know, standing up, I've got my shoulders back, I look confident. That criminal's looking at me and going, that looks like too much hard work. You know, they, they're always looking for vulnerabilities. They're always looking for weaknesses. And that person doesn't look that way. So that's probably not what I'm going to do. In the same light, if I'm a leader, the way that I hold my body can determine how people are going to communicate with me. And if I'm standing in a way that looks dominant, aggressive, well, no wonder nobody's going to come up to you. So there's ways to orient your body in order to achieve a different outcome. And that's one of the things that I looked at, which was really interesting in my, in my, my thesis, you know, when I did my doctorate, mm -hmm. I looked at this idea of changing your body attitude, the way that I describe it, so that you can change the way that you feel and ultimately the way that you think. And the outcome, at least from my research and others, is that that is accurate. And there's actually something to be said for that. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm doing a book right now with a uh, Hollywood actress on charisma. And so we're looking at the characteristics of charisma. And this is, of course, one of them. So, you know, is somebody going to be charismatic who stooped over, <laughs> you know, bumbling along? No, of course, they're not going to be charismatic. They look, you know, old or depressed. Or <laughs> that isn't going to inspire anything. Uh, and it's interesting in the charisma field, there's been quite a lot of work on, you know, the fairly obvious things that are important and, and body posture and smile and tone of voice and how you speak and the use of metaphors and all of that. But they're important. They are important. Yep. That is how people derive their impressions of you. Yeah, and I guess talking about research there, the, the place to look for that, uh, one person in particular is Amy Cuddy. She's, she's written about this, a Harvard mm -hmm. professor. Yeah. Um, she has a very popular TED Talk on that. Again, like I said, you know, you, I suppose that people listening to this, depending on how much they, they go down the rabbit hole of reading research, mm -hmm. they might say, well, you know, that's actually been disproven to some degree, maybe. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think the, the, the advice behind it is, is solid. And actually, which is interesting when we talk about the martial arts context, in martial arts, oftentimes they will refer to this concept. It's a very like, ancient concept. They'll talk about being grounded. So grounding yourself in your body posture, in your stance, enables you to deal with what's coming at you. And so that's one of the things that I try to teach as well in the martial arts world is that if you're in a stance, if you're in a body posture that is not powerful, you're going to affect the way that you interact with what's coming at you, the person punching at you, right? Mm -hmm. And so rather than when you do get hit, feeling that you can handle it, what's going to happen is you're going to feel a lack of confidence and your self-esteem is going to drop or, you know, you're going to feel afraid or whatever that comes into your head and whatever your conditioning is. Whereas if you change your body posture, if you change the way that you hold your body to a more powerful position, you are more likely to be able to endure what's coming at you and then turn the tide. And that's really important, I think. Yeah, it's huge. And of course, just talking about, about posture, posture has changed so much over the last few years, you know, particularly with the advent of computers and desk work and people on phones and, and technology all the time, the sort of slumped posture. Um, it, it really struck me. I saw a photo taken about 100 years ago of Manhattan, streets in Manhattan. And what was most noticeable about that was the upright posture of the people walking along. The ladies were walking along with their parasols. The guys were walking along upright with their top hats. I mean, you can't wear a top hat if you're slumped. It's going to fall off, right? I mean, it was so noticeable. Posture is, is so important and such a big part of that communication of the assumptions people have about you and, and presumably how you're feeling about yourself too. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's huge. I'm interested. So when you are talking to groups or talking to leaders and what have you, you integrate this physical component with the concept, the, the sort of cognitive concepts that you're trying to explain. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I think that's what makes my approach slightly different mm -hmm. is that I always try to 
have an experiential experience, right? I want people to be able to actually engage their entire self through that experience rather than just listening to me talking. And so depending on the audience, right? I, I get that, you know, I might be in front of an audience of leaders who maybe haven't done any kind of martial arts and it might be off-putting for them or they think like, what has that got to do with leadership? Mm -hmm. So I've developed a, a whole series of somatic drills, which is just a fancy way of saying body-based drills. And through those drills, through those experiences, I will teach them the ideas that I'm trying to bring across. So for example, if we have a situation where people are talking about how they struggle with uh, being attentive and keeping their attention because everything's vying for their attention. And what are the consequences of that? I might set up a somatic drill where it purposely sets them up so they're going to mess up, right? <laughs> so they can actually get that, that in, not only the cognitive understanding, they can go, okay, I'm messing up, but they can feel what the physical sensation is of messing up. And what is the consequences of that? Most people will try to either force it and try even harder and make more mistakes or people get frustrated and they want to give up. Whereas then I teach them another drill where I give them specific instructions on how I want them to change their attitude on how they approach that drill. And so that they can see that there is a shift, not just cognitively, but from an embodied perspective. And that very much leads into things like teaching people what I call mindfulness in action. It isn't my term. Tony Schwartz was the person that originally came up with that, but then I used that in my research because it best described what I was trying to achieve. Um, for example, I mean, I'm, I know a lot of people these days meditate and I'm, I'm a fan of meditation. I think it's totally valuable and people should do that. But at the end of the day, the world isn't sitting on a zafu on a meditation cushion in a nice candlelit room with incense, you know, wafting across your periphery. You know, ultimately the world is chaotic. It's unpredictable. And we'll kick you between the legs if given an opportunity. Even if you don't give it an opportunity, it's still going to kick you between the legs, right? So in those moments in time, are you able to stay present? Can you stay focused? That's a completely different experience to sitting on a zafu. And so mm -hmm. unfortunately, I find a lot of people want to go and practice meditation these days purely to relax. But they've forgotten that meditation is a brain and embodied training process where you are specifically working towards developing that ability to be in the present moment. And so I think some of it is lost. And so what I'm trying to do is bring it back. And one of the best ways that I've found to do it is to integrate it into an actual experience of the body, body in action while you are attending to what is happening on the inside and making the appropriate adjustments. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, you know, the point of meditation, I mean, it's nice to sit uh, in a comfortable spot for 10 minutes each morning, but unless that really transfers <laughs> to the other parts of the day, at least some of the time, you know, it's a nice bit of relaxation, but I'm not sure it's really doing anything else for you. Um, you know, you are, it, it's designed to be able to get you into those mental states and those states of adaptation stability and flow and all of the things that come with mindfulness uh not just when you're sitting comfortably in your living room for 10 minutes mm -hmm. in the morning and yeah exactly. i think i think that's i think that's important and of course all of these things go together don't they this this mindfulness the awareness of body the involvement of body uh the mind body connection the attitude that stems from that uh, that the control of that that you can develop, which is really what you're about, I think, is is using that to be as adaptive as possible in difficult situations. So the way that I normally teach it is through an acronym. I call it the GAME acronym. And I take people through these four very important principles. And But again, like I said, I'm always making sure that we're not just talking about it, we're actually doing it. So the G stands for grounded thinking. And my reasoning behind that is that people are not aware that how much of their thinking process affects how they behave in life. And so when you ask people to take a hard look at how they are thinking and how much of their time is spent either in the past or the future, they're quite, you know, astounded by how much of their time is, is in those two areas. And when you say, well, how much of the past and future thinking is you thinking about you know, just things that are pulling you apart and are just, I guess, negative in a way, 
most of it is, you know, you're always planning, hoping things are not going to happen this way, or, you know, you know, you're holding on to things that happened 10 years ago. So the first part is, can I get clear on the way that I'm thinking? Then once I understand how much of my time is in the past or the future, then I can actually start doing something about it. And what I tend to do then is I move to the A, which is attitude embodied. I deal with the posture first because I want people to realize that actually you don't just make changes in your head. Like I said previously, you can make changes in your body, which will affect your head, right? Your cognitive structure. Then I move to the M, which is mindful in that mindfulness in action. And what really is mindfulness? There's lots of definitions. A simple definition is to be present without judgment. And the judgment part is really important because that non-judgment is you not hooking into your stories, into your narrative. And those narratives are, tend to be always in the future or the past. So when you're telling yourself a story about why you're feeling a certain way or you're trying to justify why you're doing a certain thing, that is you either in the past or the future, depending on how you, you know, explaining it to yourself. But you're not being present, which means that you're missing everything that's happening right here, right now. And so mindfulness in action is, can I, in the action of a stressful situation, be here right now and allow whatever arises within me just to be and accept it? Because acceptance is an important part. And once you can accept it, you're no longer judging it. And once you're no longer judging it, the experience completely changes. And suddenly you see things in a very different light where maybe before you would always be reactive and always on autopilot. Now you are able to pause. And when there's that space, right? When there's that moment between the stimulus and response, just that space, which really what mindfulness allows you to achieve, you are really able to change the way that you initiate in kind of different situations, right? The way that you're going to act. And then finally is E, which is exhale, which I think breathing doesn't get enough attention. But, you know, we know that when people are highly stressed out, the first thing that's going to happen is going to affect the way that they breathe. And the reason that's happening is because your autonomic nervous system is engaging, specifically your sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight and flight response. And if you stay there, that's the part that's going to make you get overwhelmed by emotions and so one of the things that you can do is you can focus on your breathing specifically your out breath which then allows you to engage the other side of your autonomic nervous system which is your parasympathetic nervous system which is really just the part of your autonomic nervous system designed to bring you back to homeostasis to calm you down right so if you now bring the game acronym into effect in its sequence you have a very good strategy, a good tool set to be able to deal with difficult situations. You know, you first of all, you recognize that your thinking is off target, that it's projecting into things that actually you have no validation for. It's not based in reality. Then you can move to changing your body. At the same time, you can start working on being present without judgment and you can ease into your breath with acceptance. And the way that you then deal with situations will be completely different. And in my experience, far better. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, a couple of things there that definitely resonate with me. I mean, I know a whole variety of different relaxation type procedures, but for me, the single biggest one is the, the breathing, controlled breathing, because that clearly does have an immediate impact on your fight flight syn uh, syndrome and calm you calm you down there's no question about that um and so that's that's and, and you know that's such a simple thing for people to learn and develop and use it's it's astounding that more people don't use it and then the other thing you said rightly is about thinking habits um, and the difference between, you know, top-down processing, where you're looking at everything through your habitual lens, which is either future or past-based, uh, and that's how you're seeing it all, and it distorts your thinking, or you're mindful enough to do what's called the bottom-up processing, where you're just letting it come to you, and you're not judging it whatsoever. You're letting it you're experiencing it in the moment and that allows you a much more realistic and adaptive view of the situation you're in. Yeah. And I mean, you know, nobody's pretending that it's easy to do that, right? Because we are fighting our conditioning all the time. 
But my advice to people is, and this is the way that I tackled it, just personally for me, I never found, um, I mean, I do meditate, but I never found it very effective for me. Um, the way that I approached it was I really preferred to practice mindfulness in the action of living. So being present with whatever is arising, as I said earlier, and non-judging it. And the things that I would do is I would tackle the mundane, the things that we take for granted. So be that driving you know, my kids to school and getting really irate and pissed off when somebody cuts in front of me and all I want to do is just go crazy, right? That's that moment in time where I can just sit with what is arising. Don't judge it. It is what it is. It's not right or wrong. And just bring myself back to breath because I can do that, you know, with my eyes open, you know, mm -hmm. I don't need to be sitting on a Zafu to do that. Right. Or just going down to the store and you're in a hurry. And as you go in, as usual, there's a line and you're like, Oh, you know, it's just like every time I'm in a hurry, there's always a line, you know, you get people who do that. And so that's another time. So I think taking the mundane and working to be mindful in the mundane builds mm. your mindfulness muscle. And so over time, when you've done that enough times and you've able to get a handle on the small things that drive you crazy, when the big things happen, you're going to be more prepared to actually deal with that. I think oftentimes people want to just have it so that they can deal with the big things, but it doesn't work that way, right? You've got to start small. You've got to basically progressively you know, prime yourself and deal with or stress inoculate yourself. And then over time, eventually you'll get to that point where you deal with things in a lot more calmer manner. Right. I, that's a great, I, that's a great point. You've got to start, at the beginning with things that you can manage, which are everyday things. Uh, and you got to start there because you've got to practice these things. They're not just because you think, Oh, I should be calmer in a situation. And like that. that's not going to happen. You got to practice it. And the more you practice it, the more you change your brain and your body and the easier it becomes, which means in a really tough situation, you're going to do better than you would if you hadn't practiced those things. That's really, really critical. Yeah, Fundamental. You can, you yeah, and you're going to mess up, right? And you're going to not always get it right. And so in those moments in times, and even I, I mean, I've been practicing it for a long time and I still mess up. <laughs> but in those moments in time when I mess up, that's where the acceptance comes in. I think people need to just be a little bit softer with themselves. You know, and acceptance is just acknowledging that, okay, I tripped up. I didn't get it to work the way that I wanted it to. Okay, let's reset. We try again. Right? And each time you do that, things get better. And so acceptance, I think, is a very, very important part of this. Huge. Uh, and, and as you said earlier, uh, folks, this isn't about being perfect. I mean, if you want to be perfect, you're really stuck. You're in big trouble. Uh, it's about growth. It's about growth. And, you know, that's typically one step at a time. Well, the Japanese have a beautiful way of describing this. They talk about wabi-sabi, the beauty and imperfection. And so if you can look at things in that way, from that lens, I think life becomes a lot more easier to deal with. I mean, the Buddha himself talked about the fact that life is impermanent. There is no permanence. I think people get themselves into hot water, into trouble because they want things to be perfect. There is no such thing. Anyway, what is perfection except your subjectivity on that? That's only your opinion, right? What you think is perfect, somebody else will think is imperfect. Mm -hmm. So nothing is perfect. There is no such thing as perfection, but there is that ability, as I noted right in the beginning, there is that way to choose your own attitude. So you can choose your own attitude. And when you choose your own attitude in that moment in time and how you're going to respond, that is what becomes very important. When there's a difficult situation, I've got two choices. I can respond in a, in a way that's going to not feel good, or I can respond in a way that does. And I just have to remind myself which one I would prefer. You know, and if I can choose the one that makes me feel better, then that's the way to go, right? Because I think we always, the thing that I've always noted in myself, and I'm sure this is like for everybody else, is we have competing selves inside. We have the one side that wants the best for us, the other side that doesn't have the best, you know, doesn't want the best for us, just wants us to kind of take shortcuts and whatever that is. Exactly. And then we have this middle person that doesn't want to take sides. <laughs> so you have to you have to convince the side that that wants the best for you to be in the driver's seat and not let the bad side or well not the bad side i suppose but just the side that just wants to kind of get the quickest 
you know, solution to things, right. you know, not let it take charge. And then, then you, then you're in a, in a good position, I think. Uh, Rodney, this is awesome. I, I love the wisdom and the way you present it. Um, can you give the, I put this in the show notes too, but can you give mm -hmm. listeners, you know, where they can reach you, find your stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, right now, the best place is uh, primalskills.com, but that's with a Z, not an S. And so that would be the best place to find out what I'm doing, my coaching programs. And if they want to contact me, I will answer my email myself. So yeah, feel free to send me a mail. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you again, uh, Rodney. It's been really awesome. Uh, let's keep up the conversation. I'm sure we'll have you back on another occasion, but uh, really appreciate your sharing today. Excellent. Fantastic. It was a pleasure, Alan. Appreciate it. Okay. Awesome. Take care. Cool.